So are there any latte drinkers in the audience? Yeah, you drink latte? Now, I don't mean the stripped down stuff. I mean the real deal. Latte that's creamy, sweet, invigorating, and downright fattening. Are you with me? How many people will admit to that kind of coffee addiction? Yes? OK, yeah, all right. Well, I would too. I, I love a good cup of 500 calorie latte. But here's the thing. I think education today has recrafted education into something very different. We're serving our students latte in the form of no fat, no sugar, no caffeine. I contend that what we're doing in schools and universities across our country is something like what my Seattle friends call no fun latte, right? And there's something that we need to do something about. It's a big problem because our kids are being left behind. They're disengaged, they're unmotivated, and being left far short from their educational potential. So in my corner of the world, public education, it's all about the standards like the Common Core, which I'm heard, sure you've heard a lot about today. But I don't think I can blame the standards for our problems today. After all, standards, they're our vision, our goals, our dreams, if you will, for what we hope happens as a result of our educational efforts. Not too long ago, I worked with a group of teachers, and we told them to dream big, to reimagine education. And they dreamt about students who were engaged and motivated, who persevered. They dreamt about kids that were compassionate and who played well with others. They dreamt about kids who were thinkers and doers and problem solvers. And they dreamt about kids who understood really big, important ideas, like the consequences of human action. Their ideas are much like, very similar to any set of standards that we look at, like the Common Core. And they really all do a similar thing. They set a vision for how to prepare kids for the world that awaits them, and to how to prepare students who will ultimately improve the world. But somewhere along the way, students hear nothing more than this. Wah, 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 right? Have you been in this classroom? I have. I've been Peppermint Patty. I've been her. And I've been that teacher delivering the wah wah message. I've done that. We've done that. We've been there before. Somewhere along the way, as teachers try to teach the standards and unpack this good stuff, this happens somewhere along the way. And our students are left wondering, why don't our teachers get it? And we're left wondering, why don't they care about all this stuff, this wonderful, lofty stuff? You see, I think what's really happening is when we standardized education, we've done just that. We've made everything standard, the same. But our kids are anything but standard, right? So what's happening in our classrooms across the country is we're giving every child the same dose of education, the same prescribed dose, in the exact same way, at the exact same time, using the exact same materials and resources. And heaven forbid the child who looks out the window of opportunity and desires something more aesthetically pleasing. Remember what aesthetics are. They're things that awaken our senses, things that make us feel alive. Things like environmental education, the arts, health education, physical education. But these subject areas are just mere distractions today for those standardized, prescribed tasks at hand. So instead of giving our students aesthetics, we give them anesthesia, right? We dull their senses with things like drill and kill worksheets, practice testing, and Charlie Brown lectures. It's ludicrous, really. We sedate our kids in attempts to get to those lofty goals that we dreamt about so long ago. But please know that I know that the teachers are really the heroes here. It's the system at fault. Teachers are merely doing what they're told to do by their administrators, by the public, reach those standards, and raise those test scores. And speaking of tests, we do a lot of testing. And our tests are anything but perfect. So we do a whole lot of imperfect testing and even more practice testing for the imperfect tests. And like our standards, the tests are delivered in a very standardized way. The same test to all the kids at the same time, using the exact same resources, regardless of the student's readiness 
for that test. So in many ways, our kids are set up to fail. At the same time, though, testing developers are getting filthy rich, right? By the sheer number of students that are being tested and by the repeated testing policies. What we need are fewer tests, what we need are much, much better tests, and what we really need is to ask the question, the more difficult questions, like how, are each, how our children are smart, how are they smart, not how smart they are, right? How are each child smart? When we do that, when we get to that bigger question, I think what we'll find is that we have a way to connect testing with improved teaching and learning. So we live in this accountability era, and there are many costs to accountability. To begin with, student absenteeism is on the rise, as is our student dropout rates. When students do come to school, they're much more likely to misbehave. We have decreased student attitudes, motivation, and engagement. And at the same time, student anxiety, the stress levels students have at school, are at an all-time high. Teachers are actually abandoning sound instructional practices, things that research tells us works that really help kids learn. But they let go of them because they just fear they don't have the time. Most importantly, perhaps most importantly, these computers that we've heard about today, these powerful learning tools are actually declining in their use in the classrooms because they're being viewed as text, they're being used as, as testing machines. They're being used for testing and practice testing, largely inaccessible to teachers for teaching and learning. Maya Bialik, perhaps she said it best. You may know her, Amy Farrah Fowler, Blossom. She said, nobody wants to learn in a box. Profound, right? Nobody wants to learn in a box. But it seems to me that's what we're doing. We've created these nice and neat standardized packages. And we unpack the standards. And we deliver our students in these nice and tidy boxes. But unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way. But here's some good news, really good news. Our solutions, they're not rocket science. We know what to do. They're actually neuroscience. New research shows us that the brain has a center of the brain called the limbic system, and this system is responsible for emotions. So when this limbic system senses fear or anxiety, it shuts down neural pathways. It closes off opportunities to learn. But when the limbic system experiences joy and happiness in the classroom, those neural pathways open up. The brain is primed for learning in a joyful environment. So go figure. Science now provides evidence that we learn more while we're having fun, right? Who knew that? So I think there are seven ways to make it happen. By it, I'm really talking about this joyful, brain-based, deep and long-lasting learning. Seven ways. There are teachers in the classroom here today that I know know these seven ways and are using them every day. So we thank you for being here. We thank you for your hard work. But I think this is how we get back to that 500-calorie latte. The base ingredient is confidence starts with the concept that success breeds success. But I think our schooling system today mostly harms student confidence because it goes something like this. A student goes through a unit, takes a test at the end, they get either a 95% or maybe a 55%, a pass or a fail, and then they move on. And very rarely is that event connected to anything that happened before or anything that happened afterwards. So as a result, Students experience something called this fixed mindset. They develop this. It's an idea that says, I'm good at something or I'm not. I'm smart or I'm not. And it's not much I can do about it because it's time to move on to the next thing. But instead, if we can help our kids develop what's called a growth mindset, a concept that says, I can grow my neurons. I can gain intelligence through my hard work and perseverance. If we can do that, what we're finding is that growth mindset kids outperformed fixed mindset kids on just about any measure. Growth mindset kids, more importantly, take on more difficult challenges in the future. They become intellectual risk takers. Why? Because they're not afraid to fail. They know that failure and imperfection is just on the road to success. So they're much more likely to stick with something long enough to use enough elbow grease to eventually find success. The next ingredient I is optimal challenge, and I like to call it just right learning or maybe Goldilocks learning. 
Not too hard, not too easy, but just right, that sweet spot. How many here have kids to play video games? How many people here play video games? Okay. <laughs> all right, we've, we've all been here. What happens is video game developers, they are brilliant educators because they know how to keep us in what's called a state of flow, optimal challenge. When we're in a state of flow, nothing else matters. Food doesn't matter, time doesn't matter, our parents calling us to dinner, telling us to clean up our room or do homework, certainly doesn't matter. All we want to do is keep on keeping on. We can't stop the learning even if we tried. We start with a video game, we have just enough skill to get through that first level, we feel really good about it, we unlock the challenge, we get to the next level, we play a little bit more, practice a lot harder, we get through that level, unlock the next challenge, so on and so forth. Till eventually we are done with the game, we go to our parents and ask for some more money for Mario Bro 2.0, right? That's called flow. You can't stop the learning even if you tried. If tech developers can do this, educators can do this. We must do it. It's called mastery learning and Montessori schools have been doing it for years. Student choice and voice. <clears throat> Students want input. They want decision making over things that matter in the classroom, like what we teach them, they care about that. How we teach them, how we assess them in the end. They also want input and decision making over things like rules and procedures. In other words, they want democracy, motivating to adults and, and kids alike. Connectedness, by connectedness I mean that we want our kids to connect to the real world and to others. Teachers connecting to students, students connecting to students, and students connecting to the broader community. So there's this project called Frog Watch. Pretty cool project. Kids go out in the local environment, look for frogs, and then they watch them. <laughs> they find the frog, they take the picture, they write down some notes, they maybe test the water. They take all this information, all this data, and they throw it up to the web where they can share their discovery with the rest of the world. And here's where it gets really neat. Sometimes scientists access student-generated data, the stuff that the kids did. And the scientists use that information to improve what they know about frogs and to ultimately save the frogs. Powerful stuff. 500 calorie frog latte. <laughs> Curiosity. Nobody wants to learn in a box. Nobody wants to be told what to do. And nobody wants to look up the darn answer from the back of the book. It's a great big waste of time. Worse off yet is when we're asked to memorize things that we can Google in five seconds, right? The human mind is creative and curious by nature. We seek the mysterious, uncharted ideas. So we want to learn by discovery, by inquiry. So teachers, we need to get our kids to put their thinking caps on, not just every now and then, but all the time, and let them explore new ideas, new, new uh, interesting ideas, and provocative ideas. For far too long, schools have focused keenly on le left brain learning, logic, knowledge. We now know that we have to really up the uh, challenge and get to some of these right brain ideas. We have to have our kids do things like creativity, innovation, imagination, design, and engineering. The Toledo School for the Arts has, has mastered this. Consistently, they outperform other schools on these tests and on college entrance exams like the ACT. But what's telling here, not so much just by the test, but what's really telling is that these students take three art classes every single day. Big world problems like climate change and world hunger and water pollution require more than left brain thinking. So we don't need to squeeze the arts out of the curriculum. We need to embrace the arts and integrate it anywhere and everywhere we can. Finally, students seek clarity. They want to know what the path is. And we need a new mindset. Not every student needs to be on the same path. Artful teachers will help them find the path and know how to navigate the path to success. But what happens is when all kids are put on the same path, or if the path is murky, kids feel like the system is rigged, set up against them. They don't know how to navigate success. And so we need to help them figure out a clear vision so that they know that education is something that they do for themselves and for their future, not something that is done to them. I quickly want to tell you about Paul. A student of mine that I had 20 years ago who was teaching in the Lake Erie Islands. And he told me about this cave story when we were having coffee a few weeks back. What he did is he had his students go to the local island caves and explore them. When they were in the caves, 
he had them map the caves and make, create these 3D maps. The maps were so interesting and as a result that he sent them on to state officials who sent, then sent them on to a national cave organization and who knew there was such a thing. They wrote back to Paul and to his students and said, these are great maps. Will you go back out into the field, explore your island some more, make some more maps, and we think there's some more caves on your island, we'd like you to verify that. The kids went back out, did some more work. They stumbled upon a cave that they had never been to before. They found what they called their gold mine, some great stuff. Upon further research, what they realized was a hotel in the 1850s had landfilled their rubbish in one of these caves. The kids found the stuff, cleaned it up, researched what they were, how they were used, gave it to a local museum, and that's where these items exist today. I think about what happened with the standards. Many of them were covered. I don't think Paul thought about the standards. I think Paul thought about the kids. But many standards, science and across the curriculum. I think about the magnitude of learning these students experienced, far exceeding anything we could ever do on any of our standardized tests. I think about the seven ingredients. They were all Czech. This is really Frappuccino Grande. <laughs> so as we come to a close, the big idea for the long view is let's just teach for joy. It's simple, yet complex, but certainly not complicated. Let's teach for joy. Teachers, take back your classroom. Parents, community members, students, use your voice. Demand and expect something different as a result. Let's start with the idea that we don't teach words on a page. We don't teach standards. We teach people, young people. Let's start with that place of pur purpose, and let's really focus on joy. Let's remember the seven ingredients. Let's not use one or two of them every once in a while, but all of them, most all of the time. And in the end, let's serve our students that 500-calorie, full-of-fun latte and nothing less. Thank you very much.